Um, we're so excited to have Dr. Carolina Reed with us. She was going to come in person. It is her sabbatical, um, but she, you know, with COVID and everything else, we decided and, and everything on her plate that, that it made most sense to just do a, another virtual presentation. But um, Dr. Carolina Reed is one of my favorite individuals and researchers. She is a uh, associate professor at the City of Region, at City and Regional Planning at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, but she has a really cool kind of background in history. So prior to being a faculty member, tenured professor, um, she actually worked for the San Francisco Fed when I first met her. She was um, at the San Francisco Fed um, running the research office there for community development. Uh, and then she moved to the Turner Center for a year and then decided to pursue a tenure track position later in life um, and is now a tenured faculty member and just does really fabulous research that is um, very engaged with the community, um, does mixed methods, uh, qualitative and quantitative. Um, it really just kind of gets to understand the populations she's working with and, and does just thoughtful, really great research. So I thought she would be somebody that um, our doc students and, and faculty would appreciate hearing from and learning, learning from. So uh, with that, I will let Carolina take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Stephanie is my favorite person to be uh, in, in, in academia. And so thanks for inviting me. I still remember fondly the last time I came to Ohio and got to see Columbus and got to uh, do a research presentation. Um, and I also wanna thank Alan for everything he has done to sort of organize the session and help sort of uh, get everything organized, uh, wonderful and responsive. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is focused on a recent innovation in policy, which is providing funding to convert hotels and motels into permanent supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. Um, and so I'm, this is the first time I've presented this research, so I'm really excited about presenting it to all of you. And I really welcome questions throughout. Uh, a lot of the information I'm gonna be presenting is pretty technical in nature. The, the, the world of permanent supportive housing and affordable housing finance is, is pretty technocratic. And so there's a lot of terms and concepts that can be uh, unfamiliar. So please just jump in. Um, it's a little bit hard for me at, while I'm both presenting to also see the chat. So just unmute yourself and just say, hey, Carolina, shut up for a second. I have a, I have a question. Um, so let me share my screen. Everybody can see this okay? Looks good, big enough, yep, great. Um, so just give you a little bit of an outline of what I'm hoping to cover today. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time giving you the context on homelessness and affordable housing in California. Uh, California is a really unique place where I think every single trend related to homelessness and affordable housing is exacerbated. And there's some unique sort of political and policy contexts that I think are important to understand both the innovativeness of this program that I'm evaluating, um, but just also just understanding the issues here that might be very different from Ohio. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my research questions and the motivation for this research a little bit about my methods, and then I'm gonna focus on three key findings from the research. One is issues related to property acquisition and conversion, one related to funding and resident, then one related to resident services. Um, so that's sort of the, the scope. Um, so just to set the context, um, nationally, the rate of homelessness or the number of people experiencing homelessness has actually been flat or decreasing in California, the trend has been the opposite. And particularly since about 2016, we've seen a rapid rise in homelessness um, and an increased share of the population that is experiencing homelessness. Um, these data are from the point in time counts that are mandated by HUD. These point in time counts happen one night every two years uh, where uh, volunteers go out and count the number of people that they see. And then there's also an assessment of how many people are in shelter beds. We know that these numbers are a gross underestimate of how many people are experiencing homeless at any one time. When we look at the sort of larger data system of how many people are moving through or getting services in California related to homelessness, uh, the number is upwards of 270,000 individuals. Um, so it's a growing and uh, significant problem. Um, and unlike uh, other states like New York, which have a right to shelter law, uh, in California, the majority of people who are experiencing homelessness are unsheltered. 
um, about 70%. And uh, although the individual uh, factors that lead somebody to experience homelessness or to become unhoused are really complex. So it's very difficult at the individual level to predict who's going to experience homelessness. And it relates to lots of different factors like race and ethnicity, income, mental health or substance use, um, involvement in either the correctional justice system or uh, the foster youth system, um, the, the level of social supports they have, how extended their family networks are, all of those factors at the individual level make predicting who is gonna experience homelessness very difficult. But at the population level, we know that one of the biggest drivers of homelessness is the lack of affordable housing in a community. So when we look at California and we see the rising rates of homelessness in California, it is largely due to uh, the lack of affordable housing. And just to give you some context, because I know Ohio is really different, um, over here, the picture on the left, um, that's Oakland, that's very close to where I live. Um, the median house price right now uh, for a um, sort of two bedroom, one bathroom house is about 1.1 million. Um, and the median rent for a two bedroom apartment is about $3,800 a month. So we are really confronting extremely high housing costs uh, in, in, in the state. Um, there's a few reasons why California's house prices are so insane. And I wanna take a minute to talk about them because they're really important for this story. So unlike some places where poverty is the primary driver, driver of homelessness. So the problem is low incomes and not necessarily housing costs. In California, the primary driver is housing costs. Um, and part of the problem is that the state has failed to build enough housing to meet demand. And that underproduction of housing has been occurring. But the slide here just shows you the last seven years um, every, every seven years, the state goes through a planning cycle and estimates how many housing units are needed to meet current population and economic demand. It's called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation Process. And they come up with an estimate of the total number of units that the state needs to build for households at different levels. And you can see here that in the last seven year cycle, the total number of units required by the state is well below the target that was set by RENA, but that these targets are particularly difficult to hit at the lower AMI levels. So when we look at the below 50% of AMI, AMI stands for area median income. So these are people in California who are earning about less than maybe about $25,000. Uh, the number of units that we are building that are suitable for them to be able to afford um, is, is well below need. Part of the reason that we are seeing such underproduction of housing goes to complicated housing politi politics in the state. We have traditional NIMBYism, so not in my backyard. Um, but we also have a growing polarization where both political groups on the right, so more conservative political groups are resisting new housing because they wanna protect their single family homes, their property values, their neighborhoods. Um, we can think of those politics as being sort of traditional exclusionary zoning type of politics. Um, but we're also seeing an increased resistance to new housing from groups that are more progressive. And that's because of concerns that most of the new housing that is being built is higher income. And you saw that on the last slide, right? Like when, we are, when we're building housing, we're building housing for people who are earning above 120% of AMI. And so there's increasing concerns among progressive groups, among community groups, among tenant advocates, that these new housing units, which are priced at luxury rates, are leading to gentrification and leading to displacement. And so we have a situation in California where we see both progressive and more conservative stakeholders arguing against any new housing. 
and this SB 50 bill would have been a bill that would have streamlined and made it easier to build higher density, lower cost housing. And there was a huge debate around whether or not such a bill was needed and it ultimately failed because of these complicated politics. Um, and then there's also the sort of greater nimbyism of uh, a particular resistance against any kind of affordable housing being built, and particularly any housing directed at people experiencing homelessness. Um, we, we see that across the strait that communities are very resistant to seeing either shelters or permanent supportive housing being built in their neighborhoods. The other important piece of context for California is that we have our own environmental quality law, the CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act. Um, its intent is to protect the environment. Um, and it has been really important in providing a platform for community engagement around development projects. So any new development project needs to go through CEQA assessment and approval, and it gives an opportunity for communities to interact with the planning process and make sure that those new proposed developments don't actually do harm. The problem with CEQA in California is that anybody can bring a lawsuit against any development for any reason, and that person who is bringing the lawsuit can remain anonymous. And so there are a lot of lawsuits that are launched under CEQA uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the environment, but it is a tool, for example, for a homeowner who doesn't want affordable housing in their neighborhood to launch a lawsuit and prevent that development from being, from being built or delaying the, the development process. Let me stop there for just a second because I've just thrown a lot at you already and then just wanted to see if there's any clarifying questions before I keep going. No, okay. So the other problem that we are facing in California in terms of affordable housing and addressing the gap in production around affordable housing is that it's becoming increasingly expensive to build affordable housing. LIHTC, or also known as the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, is the primary mechanism by which we build new affordable housing in the country. Um, and uh, over the last 10 or so years, the cost to build a new unit of affordable housing in California has skyrocketed. We're, we're approaching $500,000 a unit or almost $700 a square foot. Um, in the Bay Area, to build one unit of affordable housing is now um, just about uh, $1.06 million. So if you have to spend that much to build a unit of affordable housing, you can think about how much subsidy you need to bring that unit then affordable to somebody who is earning, you know, at 50% or 60% of AMI. So that subsidy gap just keeps growing and growing and growing, which means that developers need to find more and more public funding to close that gap. But in California, we've seen funding for affordable housing decline dramatically. So in 2010, then Governor Jerry Brown ended something called redevelopment, uh, which was a, a, a mechanism to use tax increment financing to, uh, to finance affordable housing. And you can see just a dramatic drop off in how much funding there is in the state to provide that gap financing for affordable housing production. Um, federal funding has also declined. California has also declined, um, but it's always been pretty low in comparison to state funding. Which gets me to sort of the key point, um, and it becomes really important in evaluating the success of this hotel motel conversion strategy, is that the funding landscape to build affordable housing in California is really complex and inefficient particularly when we're looking at permanent supportive housing, which is housing that is directly targeted to people experiencing homelessness. So the bars here show you the levels of the number of financing sources that are needed to be put together to make one affordable housing deal work. Um, it's pretty extensive in affordable housing. We did a study, we see that California uses even for regular affordable housing, way more funding sources per project than in Ohio. 
Um, but when we look at permanent supportive housing, you can see that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to put together what we call the capital stack. This capital stack is what allows the developer to build the affordable housing or the permanent supportive housing unit. So you, and you can see here on the list, it's a long list, I'm not gonna go through all the acronyms, but California has gotten to this absurd place where a single developer actually has to apply to the same agency, like the housing community uh, investment department of LA twice, once for home dollars and once for HOPWA dollars, right? So you're even, even within the same agency, developers have to apply to multiple funding streams. And so the way this works is, I'm a developer, I wanna build new permanent supportive housing. I have to identify a plot of land. I have, to I have to buy the plot of land. I have to hire the architects. I have to get all my entitlements. I have to make it all the way through all of the CEQA protests and community protests, right? I have to put my financing stack together and then I have to apply for LIHTC tax credits and only one in four or five LIHTC tax credit applications actually get funded. So if I'm denied, I have to apply next year. All of which is to say that to build one unit or one project of permanent supportive housing in California generally takes between seven and nine years. And at the end, we are paying about $860 a square foot to actually make that deal work. All right. Questions? Good. So then the pandemic hits and a couple things happen at the same time. One, there is a recognition that the traditional way of providing interim shelter is hazardous to people's health, right? So shelter in the United States or shelter for people experiencing homeless in the United States has historically been structured as congregate shelter. So where there's a big room and there's lots of beds within that same room. Um, but these congregate shelters are clearly a place where there is extremely high risk of COVID transmission. Um, and so at the same time, we see that hotels start to shutter their doors because of the drop in tourism demand. And so across the country, we start to see cities renting out hotel rooms to provide non-congregate shelter for the first time. And I didn't know this before I started this research project, but until recently, there was no such thing as non-congregate shelter in a definition by HUD, right? But they started to say, okay, we can take these hotels, we can pay them the nightly rate for their hotel room, the hotel stays solvent, and we put people experiencing homeless in much safer environments. Um, and so uh, this happened across the country and a lot of hotels were repurposed for temporary shelter for people experiencing homelessness. In California, this project, this, this program was called Project Room Key, um, and it greatly expanded how many people had access to shelter, and it also just really reduced demand in these congregate shelter spaces, allowing them to do social distancing and other important things to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, but some of these hotels that were rented out as project room key sites or in other places that were also disadvantaged or that were underutilized, um, they went to city and county governments and said, would you like to buy the hotel and actually turn the hotel into permanent supportive housing or permanent shelter? And so the motivation for this research question or for this research project was really trying to understand is the use of hotels and motels for permanent supportive housing a viable strategy, right? Is this a smart way of expanding the supply of permanent supportive housing quickly and perhaps even less expensively than other forms of providing permanent supportive housing, most notably LIHTC new construction or LIHTC acquisition rehab. And we have a little bit of a natural experiment here because the expansion of COVID relief funds at the federal level that flowed down to states and cities um, really provided an opportunity for capital. So for real funds that could be deployed for this kind of strategy. 
Um, but there were some really unique, unique things about these, this money. One is that it had to be spent really, really quickly. So most of the funds needed to be dispersed in the same year that it was sort of flowed down to the states, meaning that despite the fact that all of a sudden for the first time we have all this capital that can be used for affordable housing, we can't put that capital into traditional LIHTC projects because the process just takes too long, right? If you need eight years to get to the point where you're getting your LIHTC tax credits, there's no way that you can use funds that need to be dispersed in six to 12 months. And so people were thinking creatively about how do we deploy these funds more quickly? And this is how this idea that you could purchase hotels and motels, spend that money quickly within the time frame allotted for these rent or these COVID relief funds um, and get valuable real estate as part of the process. Um, so we've done two studies, one that looked at this strategy nationally um, uh, the red sort of metropolitan areas are the areas where we uh, profiled projects that were using hotel motel conversions as a way to expand the supply of permanent supportive housing. Um, and then we did a second paper that we just released that was focused specifically on home key, which was California's program. And that's what I'm going to focus on in my talk today, just because I think home key is particularly innovative um, and also uh, really illustrate some of the challenges of this model of uh, policy delivery or policy. Um, so as Stephanie said, I love mixed method studies. I love uh, combining uh, information and interviews with people who are uh, experts and practitioners with uh, quantitative analysis that can help us to sort of generalize or see trends or patterns. Uh, for this study, we uh, scraped all the project application and expenditure data for all of the projects that we profiled. Um, in Home Key, that was 94 projects um, across uh, the, we did, I think it was 14 um, uh, non California sites. Um, and then we did interviews and we focused on interviews with practitioners. We did not interview residents in this project. Uh, we're gonna do that in a, a second stage study. Um, and we um, sampled across a wide range of practitioners that were seated in different roles and responsibilities for these projects. So city and county government officials, uh, public housing authorities, uh, developers and property owner and operators and service providers. Um, we did uh, the interviews and then we used both deductive and inductive coding around some core themes, uh, focusing on funding, property selection and conversion, partnerships and collaboration, uh, strategic planning and regulatory barriers. So let me give you a little bit of context for the Home Key program in California. California uh, is only one of two states that actually explicitly developed a new policy to facilitate this um, hotel motel conversion strategy. The other one was Oregon. Oregon's program is called Turnkey. Um, California's program is really unprecedented, both in scale and in its innovation in its design. So you can see in the chart here on the left, uh, how important homelessness has become for the state of California in just how much funding the state is deploying to address homelessness. You can just see a massive expansion from 2018, 2019 to 2021, 22. That orange bar is all home key. So home key is dedicating significant new funding to addressing homelessness. It is a program where you get grant capital. So if you are a public entity, so it has to be a public entity that applies. So it has to be either a city or county government agency applies for home key. And the state gives that entity a check. So <laughs> unlike that whole complicated capital stack that I showed you earlier, right? HCD, California's Housing and Community Deve Development Partner says, okay, you provided the application. Here's a check for the full amount. Go for it. Buy the property. 
Um, there's really minimal documentation and application requirements. So a LIHTC application in California is about 80 pages long and takes between six and eight months to fill out. This is about two and a half pages of work. So it's really sort of streamlining what you need to present and provide to get the funds. HomeKey does two other really important things. It streamlines the local approvals process, so it doesn't have to go through all the steps of entitlements. So basically all the city or county government has to say is we are using HomeKey to purchase this property and convert it into permanent supportive housing and no other council votes are needed. So it's really saying the city and county has to say, yes, we're going to invest in home key, but then at the project level, there's no room for uh, a council person to say, oh, I don't want it in my district. Um, and it exempts project from CEQA challenges. So uh, any home key project that uses state home key funds is what's called sort of um, goes through a ministerial approval process, meaning that it is not subject to either CEQA documentation or challenges. Um, so through home key, the state is trying to not only provide funding, right, to, to help uh, provide uh, an expansion of permanent supportive housing, but it's also trying to get at some of those frictions I told you about earlier. Um, in that it's trying to really streamline the funding process and also prevent this kind of nimbyism and other CEQA challenges that can really delay entitlements and approvals. The other thing that's sort of brilliant about uh, home key is in some ways, <laughs> you're gonna see there's gonna be lots of caveats to all of these positives, <laughs> um, is that by requiring that it's a public entity to apply, it has brought in public sector actors into this addressing homelessness space in a way that they've never been before. So most county governments have not been involved in affordable housing in California. And all of a sudden, because of these funds, we're seeing counties engage with the homelessness problem for the first time. We're seeing cities engage for the first time with the production of housing to address homelessness. And so it has greatly expanded political will to address homelessness and built the capacity of public entities to step into a problem space that they have not engaged with previously. Because in all the previous iterations, it's the developer who applies to LIHTC, it's not the city or county. All right, any questions about home key, about anything I've gone, because now I'm gonna go into findings. Yeah, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering, um, do public housing authorities also participate in the acquisition of these properties as well? They do. So they are a, an eligible public entity that can uh, apply for home key. And we do see uh, housing authorities participating in home key. The other major public entity that um, engaged in really interesting ways uh, were tribal nations. Um, and uh, so we, and, and it actually has made for much better relationships between tribal nations and the Department of California of Housing and Community Development um, in that it's the first time that tribal nations have interacted directly with California as opposed to HUD um, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So those were the, 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 the main purchasers of home key sites. Got it, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So what did we find? Uh, first, home key did lead to a dramatic increase in the production of permanent supportive housing on a much quicker timeline than what we see in normal PSH production. Um, so the blue bar is the number of home key units that were brought online. The orange bar is the number of PSH units brought online between 2017 and 2020, so four years. Um, home key, the applications went out in July, the first round, and all of the units were occupied pretty much by December, so six months, all right? So, and you can see Los Angeles, um, which had a very active community building PSH, right? It was uh, still a substantial increase, but then you can also see that in some of California's inland areas like San Joaquin, Central Coast, Sacramento, home key actually greatly expanded the capacity of these areas to build PSH, 
just because these other areas are not as competitive for LIHTC and they also don't have as much gap financing. So it's much harder for them to produce affordable housing than the coastal areas where you see a lot of local bond measures and also a lot of uh, foundations and philanthropic dollars that help to make affordable housing possible. Um, so Home Key had a huge impact on the overall supply, but especially in areas of the state that have not been as competitive within normal affordable housing funding cycles. We also find that initial development costs came in well below typical LIHTC projects. So in the first round of Home Key, and the reason I say first round is that there was one round of funding of Home Key, which is the one that I'm talking about here. There are two more rounds coming that are currently underway, but I don't know what those look like because they, they're not done yet. Um, permanent units that were developed under, uh, under Home Key came in at about $280,000, uh, which is about $100,000 less than even LIHTC acquisition rehab deals um, and significantly less than LIHTC new construction. Um, interim to permanent conversions means that they bought the hotels and are now looking to how to convert them into permanent supportive housing and interim units were those that were developed as interim and stay interim over time. And I'm going to show you some examples. So the other thing that Home Key did was it really allowed local jurisdictions to tailor the program to their local needs. And we see very divergent strategies emerging across the state. So the city and county of Los Angeles, which have by far the largest homeless population are really, really short on units. Uh, they went in for a strategy of let's buy as many properties we, as we can at the biggest discount we can. Um, so both the city and the county bought properties and together they acquired a total of 25 hotels and motels and apartment buildings, and they added over 1600 rooms to their inventory in just six months, um, including both individual uh, and senior uh, properties and as well as family focused properties. The majority of Los Angeles properties are what we call interim to permanent housing conversion. So they bought the properties, they moved people in, but they have not yet converted it to permanent supportive housing. And by that, it means that they need to add kitchens. So you can't have a PSH unit without at least a kitchenette or a kitchen. So they need to convert the, the rooms into more sustainable long-term living uh, spaces. Um, Oakland bought three home key sites um, or did, did three home key projects, all really different. So the one on the left uh, was a college dormitory for the California College of the Arts. It's in a really upscale neighborhood in Oakland. Um, and they are now operating the first floor as a family shelter and the top two floors are permanent supportive housing for uh, older adults experiencing homelessness. Um, the other was uh, a strategy, a scattered site strategy uh, that uh, bought 10 single family homes and converted each of those fam single family homes into uh, living spaces for six to eight chronically homeless adults. Um, and they have a really interesting model because they situate their model as a reparations for model uh, as a approach or a racial equity approach in that they only uh, purchase homes in East Oakland and West Oakland, traditionally African-American neighborhoods, um, and seek to sort of take these homes off the speculative market. And a lot of these homes were homes that were lost during the foreclosure crisis, um, but they, they see it as reclaiming these neighborhoods for people that were once living there and who are now experiencing homelessness. And so they have a very sort of explicit scattered site neighborhood community development approach to providing housing. Um, and then the last was sort of a more traditional deal where they bought a motel, again, in a very high income neighborhood um, and converted it into PSH for veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, but we also see other in, uh, interesting models emerge. Uh, this is in Mountain View, California, which is also in the Bay Area. Um, Life Moves, which is a large social service nonprofit, um, they purchased a big parking lot in between two industrial buildings. You can sort of see that here. And they filled the parking lot with these modular units. You can see each unit has uh, a bed and a small desk um, and decided to keep these as interim shelter. 
Um, you can see here in the middle here, there's a shared, this is the sort of shared bathroom spaces and this is a shared eating space. Um, the reason that they decided not to make them entirely non-congregate with their own little kitchens was because they feel like it's important for people to be able to come to communal spaces and build community as part of their journey for uh, stabilizing and being able to move into permanent supportive housing. So interesting, yes, delivered on faster, delivered on cheaper, delivered on innovative strategies at the local level that met local needs. And we found tons of challenges. The first is, and this is particularly true for Los Angeles, which said, let's buy as much as we can and then deal with it afterwards, like figure it out afterwards. It turns out that a lot of hotels and motels are not well suited to conversion. Uh, Los Angeles in particular bought a lot of Motel 6s, which where the rooms are really, really small, and it's going to be very, very hard to convert those rooms into PSH units. And the building infrastructure, like even just like the pipes and the water systems and the heating systems or the cooling systems aren't built for long-term residential use. So most of these buildings are going to need almost a complete gut and rehab. And the costs are gonna get us really close to LIHTC new construction per unit. And so the question is, is this a good approach? Because now we're gonna be putting a lot of money into buildings that not, might not be well suited over the long term, not only because of their physical structure, but also the unit size, but then also the location. Because if you think about where motels and especially sort of these motel sixes are, the majority are located along big freeway intersections away from a lot of the resident services that people experiencing homelessness rely on and potentially also exposing them to a lot of environmental hazards such as the freeway air pollution. And so I think one big debate that's starting to happen is wait a second, we're gonna be pouring a lot of money into these buildings, but actually if we had this much capital, we should have put it into LIHTC new construction where we would have gotten much higher quality units in better locations and we would have seen better outcomes for residents over time. The other big challenge that a lot of home key properties are facing is that most of these buildings and especially the ones that were acquired through home key, so undervalued properties, already provide housing as a last resort for low-income individuals and families. Uh, if any of you have read Nickel and Dimed, I, if you haven't, I recommend it, but uh, even then Barbara Ironreich says, look, a lot of people use hotels because they can't come up with a down payment or a first month's rent or, right? And so um, what is happening is that in buildings that were occupied, the people who were living there may not actually qualify for the new PSH units. And that's because maybe their family size is too big and HUD or other regulations don't allow you to have five people in a one bedroom place. And so they can't stay. Or the subsidy source isn't, they're not eligible from this subsidy source standpoint, or their income is either too low or too high, or they don't score very high on what we call the sort of acuity score, which is how we prioritize people through the coordinated entry system. And so they don't, they're not eligible because they're not the next people on the wait list. But what you have then is a challenge where you're making this unit available for somebody on the CES wait list, but then you are displacing the person who lived there who then becomes homeless. Um, this is also proving to be a problem for projects that are currently going through the conversion process because they, uh, need to move the residents for conversion and they can't find anywhere to move the residents to because that housing market's so tight. So even with a relocation voucher, the households can't find places to go. And so there's a lot of concern that the conversions themselves are gonna lead to further displacement. The biggest problem is HomeKey provides this great source of funds for capital and acquisitions but nobody thought through how do we pay for these buildings over the long term? And this is the same problem we had with public housing, right? We, we built public housing or we established public housing, but then over the decades, we failed to invest in public housing as Congress continually cut back both capital and operating support for public housing units. So HomeKey is confronting the same challenge in that 
the rents that people can pay are really low, that's in the blue bar, but the costs of operating those properties can be really, really high. And this is per unit per month. Um, and operating costs is everything from janitorial services um, to resident services like community building activities, mental health services, uh, food delivery, right? There's a complex set of things you need to do if you're operating PSH that you need to fund. Um, and there's a considerable gap between what the residents rent is that they can pay for those operating expenses and the actual costs. So here's where we run into the biggest problem. The system fragmentation really is making it difficult to dedicate operating funds to home key sites. The primary approach would be to allocate project-based vouchers to units. So project-based vouchers are provided by HUD. They pay the difference between 30% of that resident's income and the operating costs for that property up to fair market rents. But HUD limits the share of vouchers that housing authorities can use on projects, about 30% if you include uh, units for people experiencing homelessness. So a housing authority has voucher authority that they can spend and they can allocate about 30% of those to projects as opposed to tenants, um, which means that they're in limited supply. The city and county doesn't always have a great relationship with the PHA. And these PBVs are needed for LIHTC deals because they can leverage debt, because they promise a regular income stream from the project-based voucher rents, the developers can use those PBVs to leverage debt to make their LIHTC capital stack work. So PHAs put those PBVs on LIHTC properties, but because of LIHTC competition, they're often held on unfunded LIHTC, meaning that those PBVs aren't being used, but they can't be allocated somewhere else because they might get used sometime in the future for that LIHTC deal. The other big administrative barrier is that projects that use HUD funding need to abide by the National Environmental Protection Act, but the timeline for NEPA is longer than the timeline mandated by the Home Key Program. So if any of the developers want to use federal funds, they're stuck because then they break Home Key rules. And so then that system sort of breaks. Finally, we see huge frictions and challenges in this sort of network-based approach to providing PSH. And you can see that there's lots of different entities and actors that are involved in doing conversions, um, but these actors have very different cultures and levels of expertise. One of the things we found was that particularly among sort of the developers, property managers, um, there's a very little training and understanding of how to deliver trauma-informed care. Um, there's different financial and political assistance, uh, incentives across these different actors. Um, one thing we consistently heard was there was lack of staff capacity, and that has to do in part by how much we pay people who work in their homelessness response system. Um, interviewed several practitioners who said that the majority of their staff are also experiencing homelessness because they can't pay them enough to actually have them find housing uh, in, in California. Um, and then lack of integrated data systems that really sort of make it much more difficult to be able to both track how residents are doing, but also the impact of these programs um, on, their, on their outcomes. Um, so I'll conclude and leave time for questions, but um, uh, I think this Home Key is such an interesting example of how federal funds get deployed and actually implemented at the local level. I think it's innovative. I think it tries to address some longstanding challenges in affordable housing development, um, but it's confronting ongoing challenges related to fragmentation, capacity, and lack of sustained funding for operations. We're also seeing that as the sort of COVID-19 recedes, home key projects are encountering, are encountering greater community resistance and uh, entities are finding it harder and harder to find suitable properties, um, particularly as the tourism sector rebounds. 
Um, and then finally, a call. It's interesting to me how little literature there is within public management, uh, policy, and planning research on these public agency responses. Um, and this is despite the fact that it really is a public administration problem, and it's really confronting cities and rural counties uh, across the U.S. And so just a call for all of you who are interested in this topic, I think there's a lot of interesting research that can be done across all domains of this. And I'll stop there. Great, that was wonderful, Carolina. Let's um, open it up for some questions. And I guess we're all giving a virtual applause right now too. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, what kind of questions and comments do people have? Kyle, I see your hand up. Hi, this is great, great work and wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Thank Dr. You. Reed, for your time and um, for your work. I have two questions. <clears throat> the first is, I think that it's it's wonderful to see uh, you to do you doing mixed methods, but uh, I want but I, I want to acknowledge that there is this all alternative um, uh, belief that doing mixed method scholarship, it in some way discounts the quantitative or qualitative in that integration that you can't like do a, give due justice to either one by combining them. <clears throat> do you agree or disagree that you're losing something when doing mixed methods? Um, and why? Uh, so I don't think you lose anything. I think using mixed methods, even when, so in this case, the quantitative analysis is largely descriptive, right? I'm not trying to do any kind of causal inference in this analysis. What we're looking at is application data, expense data, trying to understand trends in that as opposed to saying, you know, X causes Y. I think in any case, doing mixed methods research tightens your questions and also allows you to really, if you're doing really, like even if you're doing uh, either descriptive or econometric analysis, it makes sure that your questions are better and sharper and also that you can have theory driven interpretation of your results, right? You know what those results actually are saying and why those results are happening. Um, so I love it. I do it for everything, even when I am doing more causal inference type work. I think it is very hard to market mixed methods to journals. So I would say that the way I approach my research is always perceive projects as mixed methods, but maybe think about tailoring the journal articles to one or the other, because it is very hard in one journal article to do justice to the richness of both approaches. And so, for example, if I was trying to send this to a journal, I would really be focused on the qualitative interviews findings and not try and also present it as a quantitative analysis. And if at some point I have more data on home key and particularly the resident level data, maybe I try and do something econometrically, but then I would sort of leave that as, as its own piece. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that it is, you do lose some richness when you write, uh, when you write up, um, do, when you do the write-up. Yeah, or I, I guess you, you, you keep the substantive richness, right? Because when you're writing up, for example, when I'm writing up the qualitative findings, let's say I've done one where I'm doing some causal quantitative and qualitative. When I write up the qualitative, I can actually point to the quantitative as these results are generalizable or these were these held up in quantitative analysis. But in quantitative, when I'm like, this coefficient was positive, reasons for this could be those reasons are well informed and not just me sitting on you know my chair making up reasons and so i don't think you lose the richness but presenting all of it in one journal article is hard okay thank you so much and then real briefly the second question i have is this example of financing affordable housing seems to be an excellent example of red tape that developers will have to go through when working with local governments I'm wondering if you could speak, I think this is, it's an exemplary example, actually. And so understanding how to eliminate this red tape in affordable housing provides lessons on how to eliminate red tape in other areas. I'm wondering if you have any insights about 
that level of fragmentation that exists with financing and if there are any key takeaways for how to ensure greater efficiency and effectiveness in the development and implementation of social policies like affordable housing, for example. Yeah, so I think that, so the red tape is complicated, right? Like I think red tape is actually an oversimplification of what's going on here. I think you have the fragmentation, which is the result of a housing policy framework in the United States that has accreted over decades and never has actually thought about what is the best way of building and financing and operating affordable housing, right? With every single political uh, administration shift has like made little tweaks to the system, but all those tweaks just add up to a very complicated system as opposed to saying we need to actually make housing an entitlement, right? And we're going to develop it this way and we're going to simplify that. So I think that's one element. I think the local government red tape is much more complicated because it's political, right? The local governments do not have an incentive to build affordable housing. And so the red tape that exists there is about the local power to exclude. And so that's going to require a significant shift in political orientation and or stronger state mandates. I don't know if oh, this is true in Ohio, but in California, local zone zoning is a local police power. And so the, the challenge in California has been to take away that local power. And it, 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 right now we have a new ballot initiative uh, that is going to propose to voters that the state cannot make any land use laws, which would then negate all of the legislative changes California has made to make it easier to build lower cost housing. So I think there's, there's the administrative red tape, and then there's the sort of politically motivated uh, roadblocks that are actually motivated by something very different than like bureaucratic concerns over fraud. Thank you very much. Matt? Yeah, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, actually kind of a follow-up to the question I asked before, in, in terms of these new public entities that are entering into the space of acquiring and operating affordable housing, uh, and they did it so quickly, how have they managed uh, property management um, and what have been the sort of stumbling blocks in that process? Yeah, so that's a terrific question. And I will say lots of stumbling blocks. So there were a bunch of county welfare agencies that applied for home key and realized once they had the properties that they had no clue how to be a real estate developer or property manager and are really struggling because they approach the property from a trauma-informed wellness perspective and they wanna help residents the most. And they are confronting all of these housing bureaucracies and bureaucratic rules that say, no, if this household doesn't isn't eligible, you have to evict them. And they're like, I don't wanna evict them, right? I'm a, I'm a welfare person. I am from social welfare. I care about this household and yet the housing policy requires that they evict them. So there's been tons of tensions there. Um, what is happening in most places where the public entity ended up with the project and realized that they can't manage it is that they're putting out bids now for new owner operators. So they're putting out RFPs to say, we're looking for nonprofit affordable housing developers who wanna take on these sites. But the challenge is that none of them, none of the developers want to because of the lack of operating funds. So they're saying, wait a second, you're telling me I need to take ownership over this property. I have to keep it affordable for 55 years per the home key covenant but you're telling me that you don't have any money for me to operate this property for 55 years, right? Hell no, I'm not taking it. And so um, in the second round of home key, the way this is being resolved is that even though it has to be a city or a county agency or a public entity that still applies, they are putting out for bids at the start. So rather than saying, I'm gonna buy it and then ask for people, they're gonna say, we wanna put in home key sites. Are there any affordable housing developers out there that wanna go after these home key funds? And so in the second round, that seems to be resolved a bit. Got it, thank you. 
Maham, and if, apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. No, you got it. It's Maham. Thank you so much. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, I am largely interested in nonprofit organizations. So when you mentioned um, Life Moves, um, I have a couple of questions just related to the role of nonprofit organizations. So first, um, are nonprofit organizations eligible as applicants or co-applicants um, for Home Key? And then my second question is um, what you see sort of as the evolving role of nonprofit organizations um, uh, as it relates to like the structure, design, and implementation of Home Key. I know you mentioned the nonprofit um, afford, uh, housing affordability um, developers uh, and things like that. So I think that's just what I'm curious about how um, you know their role um, in addressing homelessness in um, California and other and other parts of the states like will look like, and what you're sort of seeing from your findings. Yeah, so that's a terrific question. So. Um, Nonprofits can be co-applicants as long as the primary applicant is a public entity. So a public entity can partner with a nonprofit um, and, and, and sort of put in a joint application for home key. So they are critical partners. And even when it like even in LA, for example, where the city and county purchased all the properties, the county is going to hold all the properties in LA. So they're not going to uh, transfer them to other entities. Even so, right, all of the services that are being provided on those properties are generally being provided by nonprofits. So there is a really rich ecosystem of service providers that intersect with each of these properties. Um, the, the big question is how to fund those services and how to give those nonprofits enough resources so that they can effectively serve this dramatic expansion of PSH. There's going to be a, there's a new rule in California that is going to be transformative, where if the person is um, Medi-Cal eligible, those Medi-Cal funds can be used to provide for services and housing for that household. So it has the potential to unlock huge amounts of health dollars for permanent supportive housing. The problem is nobody knows how to do it because it has to come through hospitals and managed healthcare organizations that have no experience working with housers and housing people have no sense of how to bill Medi-Cal, right? So there's a sort of real disconnect between these two systems, but if we could integrate them, it would unlock a lot more dollars for resident services and provide those nonprofits with the resources that they need to actually deliver services across those properties. But there's other cool things like just and uh, we're running out of time. Oh, we're totally out of time, aren't we? Oh. All right, I'll, I'll, let me take a couple more questions, but I'm happy to talk about it in the little session afterwards. Um, Alan? Oh. Actually, my same point is that I have a couple questions, some that were given to me, but I wanted to say, if you'd like, because I know we won't have time for all of them, if you wanted to drop your email in the chat, if you felt comfortable with that, so people could reach out afterwards. And then yeah. from here, Dr. Moulton, if you want to quickly wrap up for us, because we want to be mindful of time. And then afterwards, we can switch over to the PhD meetup. Yeah, sure. No, um, Carolina, this was great. And I think that the number of questions shows that, that people are really interested in the topic, but then also just in how you approach research. So um, all doctoral students, you are invited to attend a kind of coffee hour, if you will, with uh, Dr. Reed. That'll start immediately um, as soon as we're done here uh, and go to 2.30 and you can just pick her brain about um, different things with her research. Um, and, and I think that would be that would be wonderful. So thank you for, for being here today. And for those of you that are jumping off, remember next week we have Colin Merritt coming and he will be on campus um, and he's coming from IU PUI so check out his bio um, it should be a really interesting talk and there are still some spots to sign up to meet with him one-on-one -on -one. so those of you that are haven't signed up yet please do so so um, with that we'll let everybody go except for those that want to stick around for the amazing coffee hour with Dr. Dr. Reed and, uh, <laughs> and pick up <laughs> some more.